Hey, Bill, you the guy who was calling me? <laughs> Nobody else, Tech. I got a question. You see, I know how the power flight automatic transmission works. But since it's now used on the Plymouth, I'm wondering if it's still the same unit. Yep, you can relax, kid. It works the same as it does on our other cars. Everything you've learned so far still applies. Plymouth uses power flight in connection with the new power flow engine. And I don't mind telling you it makes a sweet performing job. Wait till you have a chance to drive it. You're right, Tech. Now, uh, what do you say we finish checking this condition? What's the matter with this transmission, Sam? The shift pattern is a little off. It upshifts between 10 and 15 miles an hour, no matter how much throttle opening you give it. Bill and I checked the line pressure and found that was okay. Well, that was a good start, Sam. What's got you stumped? Well, maybe I'm not really stumped, Tech. Suppose I do a little thinking out loud and you see if we're on the right track. The transmission upshifts because governor pressure goes to one side of the shift valve and gradually overcomes the throttle pressure on the other side of the shift valve. Now, since our upshift is too early, the governor pressure is building up against the shift valve too strongly and too soon. It's either that or the throttle pressure isn't strong enough to hold the shift valve in the downshift position until the normal upshift speed is reached. Very good, Sam. You win a cigar. What are your plans? Well, we haven't checked throttle pressure yet, so I think we'd better tackle that before we take a look at the governor. Say, isn't it always smart to make a visual check of the linkage to be sure it's free, not binding on anything? You're on the ball, Bill. That sure is a point to cover. Mm-hmm. Gear shift and throttle linkages are okay. So I guess we better hook up the 100-pound gauge for our throttle pressure check. Do you remember that operation, Bill? Yep. We put the selector lever in the neutral and let the engine idle at 475 to 500 RPM. Fine. Now be sure the handbrake is securely set, then shift the selector lever to drive range. Normal pressure should be 13 to 15 pounds at idle speed. Looks like our throttle pressure's okay then, Sam. Fine. Now pull down on the accelerator pedal slowly and watch the gauge. If the throttle valve is working freely, there should be a sudden rise in pressure. Pressure should rise and fall as engine speed increases and decreases. Hey, we're getting that sudden rise in pressure. Well, that rules out throttle pressure then. And we know our line pressure's okay. So the next logical possibility is a stuck governor valve. What do you suppose is behind that, Sam? Well, Bill, in this case, we'd suspect that the governor valve was stuck open. Now, just to be sure, let's check governor pressure. You've got to let the wheels turn during this check, so release the handbrake. With the selector in neutral, start the engine. Then move the selector to drive. You should read about 15 pounds pressure at a speed of 14 to 17 miles per hour. 15, huh? The gauge reads about 60. Well, that proves the governor valve is stuck open. Because with the governor open, oil pressure would build up against the shift valve too soon, and zingo, there comes that early upshift. Yeah, and then you boys would be in for some work. Mm, you're right as rain, Tech. We'd have to remove the governor to see what was wrong. Wait a second. I'm not sure I'm with you, boy. Could you slow down a little on the turns? <laughs> ah, glad to. Let's remember what happens hydraulically when the car gets underway. That's when the rear pump begins to supply oil and build up the pressure, right? Yeah, yeah. And the governor is what allows pressure against the shift valve to increase gradually. At the proper car speed, then, enough pressure develops to move the shift valve. Moving the shift valve opens a passage that channels oil under line pressure to the direct clutch and to the offside of the front servo, causing the upshift to take place. So, you can see that if the upshift comes in too early after the car starts forward, governor pressure is being applied too quickly through the governor. Yeah, I follow that now. And that governor valve stuck open could be to blame, hey? Yeah, that's the general idea, Bill. So you'd have to remove the transmission extension housing 
and take the governor out for cleaning. You might save time by trying that air pressure shortcut. Air pressure? You guys trying to pull my leg? Well, it just so happens we're serious, Bill. Bring that compressed air hose over here and we'll show you. Man, oh man. The things I do for my Uncle Sam. All right, boy. Just clean off the area around the governor pressure takeoff plug and remove the plug. And since we're going to blow air through the unit, you better cover the oil filler tube with a cloth. Now, give me a little room, Bill, and watch a super master technician go to work. Now, notice that I screw a piece of one-eighth inch pipe into the hole and then put the air nozzle up to the other end of the pipe. Now, at the same time, I've got a rubber hammer in my other hand. So, as I apply short bursts of clean filtered air to the passage, I tap the parking drum very lightly several times. Just enough to jar the governor. And I'll break your arm if I catch you beating on that drum with anything but a soft hammer. And that, my boy, is all it takes to shake loose any foreign particle out of that governor valve. Now, that's a very effective one-two punch. You remember it. Holy catfish. You guys really serious? Sober as a judge, Bill. Let's check governor pressure again and see if the governor valve is working now. Well, I take it back, fellas. The compressed air treatment really works, because we get the proper pressures now. That's fine, Bill. And if you ever get rusty on governor pressure specifications, be sure to check with the chart in this reference book. I'll do that, Tech. Another thing we'd better do, Bill, is to road test this car for a few miles, just to be sure that whatever we blew out doesn't work itself back into the governor valve. Frankly, the compressed air is not a sure cure. It usually works in more than half these cases, and it can be a time saver. So let's double check this car out on the road. And so our correction held up okay. What would you have done if the compressed air hadn't worked out? Well, we would have had to take the governor out for cleaning, Bill. You'll find that removal procedure spelled out in this reference book, Bill. You won't have any trouble figuring it out. Swell, Tech. I'll sure look it over. It's mighty important to know how to clean that governor valve, Bill. So I'll go get some governor parts out of stock and show you what's involved. Good idea, Sam. Well, Bill's got the dishpan already, Sam, so he can go right ahead and wash your dishes. <laughs> Get going, Bill. I'm glad to see clean solvent in that pan, too. That's important. Now, once the governor parts are out, clean them carefully. Then blow them dry and set the parts down on a piece of clean paper. Blow clean air through the passages in the governor body. Don't ever use a rag, Bill. It leaves lint on the parts. I see. Inspection come next? Right, Bill. Check the valve and body especially for score marks. Replace any parts you find are scored if you can't polish out the marks. Check the valve lands carefully to be sure they're not nicked or rounded. Make sure the valve works freely in the body before you reassemble the governor. And when you reassemble the governor weights, make sure the secondary weight moves freely in the primary weight. Okay, Sam. Will do. And now, if somebody will turn this record over, we'll get on with our story. Let's go back to when we were checking throttle pressure, Sam. Suppose we fail to get a sudden rise in pressure. Suppose our trouble wasn't with the governor valve at all. What would you do then? Well, in that case, Bill, there might be some interference in the linkage on the valve body, which prevents the throttle valve from working properly. So, we'd have to get that valve body out and look it over. Now I just happen to have a valve body sitting in a stand on the bench behind you. I'll get it over here and show you what we'd have to do. First of all, of course, we'd have to inspect the shaft, levers, and linkage on the left side of the valve body for freedom of movement. Then here's another important step. Work the throttle valve cam back and forth and see if the cam contacts the roller in the operating lever. Normally, the increase in throttle pressure comes about as the control lever rotates the throttle valve cam. The cam, in turn, operates against the roller in the operating lever. As the cam rotates, it moves the cupped end of the lever down. That compresses the spring against the throttle valve. Yeah, Bill. So, 
as you move that cam back and forth, make sure that the cam face contacts the roller. Right, Tech. And if the cam isn't in constant contact with that roller, put your eagle eye along the outer surface of the operating lever. There's got to be clearance between this lever and the hub of the manual valve lever assembly as the off area of the cam face touches the roller. You mean clearance at the crown section of this operating lever? That's the spot. That raised section just above the roller can hold the roller away from the cam. Well, you're going to have to do something about this lever, Sam. There isn't enough clearance. Yeah, you're right, Bill. So let's take the operating lever out of there. Just unscrew the adjusting screw while you hold the other end of the lever down. But do that carefully, Bill. That spring and spring retainer might pop out. You sure don't want to lose them. Okay, Tech. I'll watch it. Now replace the operating lever with this new one from stock. Oh, yeah? But suppose we didn't have one like that in stock. Well, in that case, Bill, you just have to rework the old lever by grinding the crown section down enough to provide clearance. If you ever do that, my boy, be extra sure you clean up carefully. Metal grindings inside the valve body can be mighty rough on that transmission. Don't worry, Tech. I'll clean her slick as a whistle if I do any grinding. And here's something else. When you install either a new or reworked lever, be sure that the spring retainer is installed in the cup of the lever. Oh, oh. I'll keep a close eye on that. Now what should we do? Well, Bill, this adjusting screw should be turned into the valve body and at a specified distance, too. One and eleven sixteenths inches from the end of the screw to the valve body, Bill. That's the preliminary setting. You'll have to adjust the throttle valve when you button the job up. Okay. One and eleven sixteenths. Got it. Fine. Now, check the lever operation to be sure that the cam makes proper contact with the roller. With this new lever in, there's plenty of clearance so that the cam and roller are really getting together. Good. Now you'd put the valve body back in the transmission. Refill the unit to the low mark with new oil. That's because it expands about one quart when it gets heated up. Next, we'll check the throttle pressure and adjust it if necessary. At the same time, we'll look the linkage over for freedom of movement. Now, Sam, how about a word on those cases when the starting motor won't crank the engine? Oh, yeah, Tech. That's a once-in-a-while condition that Bill ought to know about. Even though the selector lever's in neutral, Bill, the neutral switch may not close properly for some reason, and the starting motor won't work. This condition is apt to show up when the transmission is cold, but it could happen any time. You don't mean an outright switch failure, do you? No, although that could happen, even though it would be rare. I'm talking about three other possibilities. For example, the manual valve lever arm might be bent, or the switch gasket might be too thick. Either condition would keep the arm from contacting and depressing the switch ball. Besides that, there's an outside chance the transmission case might not be spot-faced deep enough to let the switch enter to the proper depth. That's right. I've seen some of those cases, and it's worth checking into. Well, okay, Tech. It is a possibility we'd better cover, along with those other two conditions I mentioned. So here's how you'd track down this type of complaint and make the necessary correction. Of course, you'd check over the gear shift linkage first. You gotta be sure the manual control lever is doing what the selector lever calls for. After that, pull the switch wires out and... Hold it. Before you do any monkeying with the switch, be sure the selector lever is in neutral. Better still, pull the high tension wire out of the coil. If that engine should start, somebody might get hurt. Glad you mentioned it, Tech. You can't be too careful. Now, as I was saying, pull the two neutral switch wires out and connect them together. Next, turn the ignition to start. If the starting motor works, it probably means that when the manual valve lever moves to neutral, the ball isn't depressed enough to complete the electrical circuit in the neutral switch. That may mean a faulty switch. So, test the switch by putting it in the backup switch spot. Move the selector to reverse, and if the backup lights work, the switch is okay. Yeah, Bill. 
And that will be your cue to check for a bent manual valve lever arm. Tex right. If the manual valve lever arm is bent, it won't contact the ball squarely and will slide to one side of the ball during operation. In fact, it might slide out of position so far, the pin on the arm will slip out of the lands on the manual valve. How should I check for that bent arm, Sam? Well, there are two ways, Bill. Just stick your finger through the switch hole and feel if the lever is in the center. Or, using a mirror and flashlight, you can see if the arm is straight and in position. Suppose I do find a bent lever. Well, in that case, you'd remove the valve body from the transmission and straighten the arm. One thing you want to be sure about is that the pin is fully engaged in the lens with just enough clearance so no side thrust can be exerted to spring the manual lever. I see. Now, suppose the lever arm was straight, but the switch just didn't go in far enough. What then? Well, that might mean the case wasn't spot-faced deep enough. The best thing to do is to replace the gasket with a thinner one. If you don't have a thinner gasket, you can make one from brass or copper shim stock ten thousandths thick. Huh. I might have known it'd be something that simple. Well, anyway, Bill, you've learned some useful tips about taking care of power flight equipped cars. And now that Plymouth is offering power flight, just about three out of every four cars you service will be equipped with this transmission. That's why you fellows better do some studying so you'll know all the answers. Okay, Sam. I'll do my part to keep our owners happy. That's the spirit, Bill. Nobody needs to tell you how important our owners really are. Our service business depends on how much more we know about keeping cars in top condition. This maintenance story is another long step toward our goal of more thoroughly satisfied customers. Thank you.